Welcome to my next part of the uh, little tutorial I'm doing on how to make a Defender game in Unity. I'm just uh, going to show you a little bit about how the uh, landscape was put together in the latest version of uh, Guardian of the Humanoids, which is my little demo that I'm using and might eventually publish, but it has to be more than just Defender. But for now, I'm just doing the basics and getting the classic game together. So we have the dynamics working, and we have the controls, and we have all the features that are important in a Defender game. So one thing, of course, is classic mode. You want to have something that resembles the original Defender for a kind of a classic mode and a classic feel. So I went back to the original Defender uh, playfield, and I got a copy of uh, this graphic here. And you can see I've stitched together from a few different screenshots of playing Defender games uh, in MAME, the arcade machine emulator. And uh, I've taken that and stitched it together here in Photoshop. And then I meticulously went through all the uh, different points in Photoshop and found all the places where there's either a peak or there's a valley. And I just sort of made a long list of all these points. And eventually I had a pretty good long list of several points that I could start to use to put into a program and make this actually happen. Of course, I chose OpenSCAD since I've been using that for some of the other graphics that I've been doing. So let's take a look here. Before I went to, uh, so here you can see uh, the points that I have. A lot <clears throat> written down. And actually if I go to here, this is sort of how I originally wrote them down. I put them down in um, these little groups. And mentioned each, which one's a peak, which one's a valley. I just kind of labeled them as I went. So there are little places where there's flat spots, and then the next flat spot, and then there's a valley, and then there's a peak, etc. So I kind of marked some of these, and I thought that might be helpful. But in the end, it didn't really prove to be that important to keep those. But for my own sake, so I could tell where I was, was uh, where I was in the process, I kept these going. <clears throat> so what I ended up here uh, with was a series of points that were uh, pretty cool and uh, overall looked pretty pretty perfect. Um, and you can see here that uh, I used a, a canvas in the browser so that I could draw it and that made it easier for me to see my results as I was doing some tweaks. What I wanted to do is take all the places where there were perfect little peaks uh, like say here and uh, here and here. I'll take just the small ones like there's this area here which is kind of, you see, it's pretty rough now. But before I roughened it up it was uh, much more smooth and just kind of pointy, point, point, point. And uh, it didn't really look very good as an asset in a game, a modern game. Uh, it needs to be a little less perfect, a little less uh, up and down. And of course, the original graphic doesn't have really that that aspect. The area I'm talking about is sort of like over in here. These little areas where there's been a lot of uh, where there's a lot of these little jumpy bits, but they're really meant to be like kind of like flat areas. But sometimes it was fun to have them be marked off as little areas where they were bumps. And so I took and roughened up some of those spots by using uh, this JavaScript here. I figured JavaScript was the best way to go. It's just it's quick to use. You just slap it together, and I just took the points, the original points, did some adjustments to them based on whether they were small peaks or small valleys, and then took that and, uh, final result and just output a new string, uh, printing out the new values, and then here you can see I just copy this, paste it into the, into OpenSCAD, I took this that I had, and I actually added some points to make the, uh, the bits over on the, on the right side a little rougher. Um, see here. Make these a little rougher. I actually added a point uh, next to each peak and next to each valley. And then I just kind of adjusted them a little bit. 
and so it ends up being more rough. And so when you bring it over into Open SCAD, you can see some of the results here. And there it is. Good. So all I really want to be able to do is take those points and bring them into Open SCAD and make a nice version of the landscape model and then be able to use this and bring this into Unity. So I started out in OpenSCAD and of course from here I export an STL file and then <clears throat> I take that STL file and I, well, I didn't export actually the whole thing. It's one of the things is I actually set it up so that I can either do one half that or the other half. And then I can just export the half that I want. Because the landscape needs to be split in half so that it can be for a uh, you know, forever looping. So I took that and brought it over into, uh, let's see, here we are. <laughs> I used to have these all in my order. Uh, <clears throat> I brought them over into Blender. And from Blender, then I'm able to adjust the size, make sure it's just right and finally export as uh, FBX. And in this case, with, uh, the important thing is I'm using Z minus Z forward and Y up, because if you look at the uh, views that I was using for these, this is from top down. And so, I, and I also made it in Open SCAD as top down view. So this is now, when exported, needs to be exported in just that way. Uh, in this case, minus Z to bring it into Unity to face the right way. And now, if we bring it over into Unity, you can see here I imported, uh, I export the FBXs, and then I bring it here, and I just set generate colliders on it. I turned off the mesh compression, and I turned off the optical. Maybe I'll put those back on, but I was getting some weird uh, artifacts in the way that it was rendered. <clears throat> so I turned that off. To get the outline effect uh, was pretty easy. Uh, I made an instance of the terrain, which is the main terrain you see here in the view, and it's uh, the same color as the background, uh, sort of a blackish color, blackish blue. And then created an outline version, which has this uh, kind of color the brownish color, and that is uh, two pixels or uh, two units higher uh, than the one in front, and so it shows through just that amount, and the background colored one is in front hiding the rest, and so you only see the line. And then for the radar, I needed to do something similar. Basically, I could keep the, uh, this, the other terrain the same, pretty much. And then, but I needed for the radar outline needs to be a little thicker because if there's only two and the camera being so far away from it, uh, it comes out much, much smaller. So it needs to be about 10 or more just to make it so that it shows up in the radar. Uh, and then once that's done, you're done, I just had to put it back into my, into my world half system. And uh, if you haven't seen the world half system, I have a code for that ready to go to show you next, um, but this is a pretty simple idea. You have uh, a world that's broken up in two halves, and you show uh, as you approach uh, the middle of one of them, as you cross that point, you take the one behind and you leapfrog it ahead of you. Uh, but basically it follows the camera, so if I'm too far from the camera, then I should be on the other side when I'm closer to the camera. And so it jumps to where it's closer to the camera, and if it notices it's too far on the other, direction from the camera, it jumps back to where it was. So as you go back and forth, the landscapes can be moving around. And then the uh, other cool thing I can demonstrate as the game runs is that uh, the little guys, the enemies, and everything are actually parented to these halves of the world. So if I start the game... Uh, as I parented to the world, and pardon the, the 
jumpiness is because I'm recording the screen, I'm sure. Uh, but you can see that as the world tabs move, the little enemies will move along with the world tabs. Put my ship down in here. <clears throat> and then uh, switch to the scene. Here we go. And you can see if I were to move some. I'm indestructible, so let's keep flying. Uh, uh, the world have has moved ahead. I probably didn't see it, but you can see it in the previous video where I went this a little more. But uh, now, and you can see that the landscapes, of course, look very nice. They're very close to. As an homage to Defender, this is you know this is as close as you can get. Um, using some of that that original world, let's revisit that world, and, but let's make a little more updated, more kick ass, <laughs> add some more special effects, and then expand it. And you can see I've actually got you closer up to the landscape than the original game, so it's not exactly the original game. If I were to scale it down more, uh, which I may do very well, I may very well do, uh, the world, this uh, mountain that you see here should really only be about to maybe this height. So we'd make the world smaller uh, by a significant percentage, but again, uh, that's this is really for the most sort of classic game. And as I get into the expanded game, uh, hopefully I'll have more, <laughs> more interesting landscapes than just this and you know, other things going on. Uh, but all this is time-consuming, so I'm just getting this as solid as I can. Uh, the other thing I want to demo for you. Uh, as long as we've got this going on. Uh, let's stop this game here. And start a new one. Real quick. Uh, is I still Super God Mode gets on. So if I go to my scene now, um, watch the little green guys, and let me bring up uh, some of this landscape here. And see now, all these little green boxes are just colliders. That's all they are. They're just plain colliders attached to game objects. And that's what they do. When one of the bad guys, one of the drones, runs into one, he follows it. And as he runs into the next one, they do that too. <laughs> they, uh, see, he follows that. Oh, now I've hit this one, now I follow that. Well, I've hit that one, and I've hit that one. See, they continuously follow until they find a little settler and then they pick them up. But that was my solution to the problem of how do you keep them going? How do you keep them moving across? Um, and, and these are called, I just call them ceilings, but they're not really ceilings. Um, originally, they were going to be like the highest point you could go to or the lowest point or something. Maybe they're floors, but. They're more like uh, little things to follow. And so, yeah, very straightforward, very simple um, idea. This one, I guess, I intended to be bigger. But the idea is that they're just playing colliders. So if I go back to my scene, and this one, which I wanted to fix, and we'll hide the other half of the world so we're not confusing ourselves. You see, there's the, the place where this one used to be. Okay, let's look at it in context with the rest of it. There we go. Um, pretty good. Here's a problem. This is an interesting thing about this. Is you kind of have to predict what the little guys are going to do. As, a, as one of the drones comes along and runs down this, you'll hit this, but when he goes up again, it's going to completely just fly off into space. So what I want to do is intercept him with this platform. So that's the idea. Anyway to make sure it's the right height to intercept them. And uh, let's see. There it is. Um, so I think I might need this to be a little bit here. But it needs to move over, but I think it's probably, yeah, let's try again. What's the number on that one? Sorry, I remember 35, okay. Um, 
it's really not. The names don't matter so much because it's helpful to know that there's that many of these things. So all I really want to do is make this one large enough so that everything that's supposed to happen happens. <laughs> There we go. And this this is in lieu of doing some kind of other thing where you have uh, maybe a system where it's a floor and they follow the floor. I could do something like that. Um, the let's see this one here probably be a little like this. So it really is like that large. As long as they're sticking out so that it's not because the idea is once they've hit it they go perfectly following it up following the line so as this goes up you'll definitely hit that and definitely start going down definitely hit this definitely hit that you can see as long as there's something sticking out they'll definitely run into it so you just need these little extra prominences uh, on the tips of each of these to make sure that they follow back down and I've adjusted each of these closely but I could I could tighten them up uh, especially in this other half here I think I probably did half of them but that one doesn't need to be so pointy pointy uh, there. <laughs> so you can see this is all the kind of adjustment that you do. Uh, so that's a systematic way of making what I want to happen happen. Um, so sometimes this is the way you can you you can work with Unity this way. You just make some sort of system. This is my system. Colliders that make little bit drones follow them. Uh, and then if you want to see the code, that's next. I'll show you the code that makes them follow them because it's kind of the neat the neatest part. Uh, so let's go over to here, and here's, let's go to lander. Lander is what I call drones, or drones are landers, I guess. I call them drones, but in the original Defender they were landers. So the first thing that happens is that uh, you have uh, a trigger that happened. A lander is moving along, and it's following certain, they're little finite state machines. They uh, have a little coroutine that runs during a certain behavior, and while it's doing that behavior, it will do certain things. And so in the case of uh, when it runs into a ceiling, it notices that, and so it sets a flag on itself on touching the ceiling. And it then it remembers which ceiling it touched, uh, because it needs to know if it's still touching it, or if it's, say, moved off and went into something new. And then based on its state, and I don't care what uh, what it's doing in these states, as long as it's in any, there's any state besides these, then it starts to find. And so I assume, uh, for example, it's not in find state already. And find state means it turns on its uh, tractor beam and then looks for little settlers to pick up. And you can see that happen when the game is running. Uh, and so then, uh, if the state is now find settler, uh, it's running, into, so it was, say it was already, Find settler, that's fine too. Uh, then I have a big comment here explaining it, but I'll just sort of give a little overview. I take its original velocity because we want to preserve that. I take its um, ang the angle of the ceiling it ran into uh, on the z axis, which is how I rotated it. I take its magnitude, that is to say, the magnitude of the velocity. So uh, that tells us, uh, I guess that's basically the velocity itself, and so I'm going to be using that. If the magnitude is, all, is greater than the speed that a lander is allowed to go, then I limit it. Then I do a little math to check if the angle of the thing I rotated is minus, then I add 360 to it. It makes it simpler. Then if it's greater than or equal to 180, then I subtract 180 to keep it between 0 and 90 when it is. If it's flipped over, then I flip it back over, pretend it's flipped over. And then, if the velocity that I'm moving left, in other words, uh, if this lander is moving left, and uh, the angle is greater than 90, in other words, if I'm moving left and the angle is greater than 90, or, and then if this ch also checks, this is an interesting feature of Boolean math, I'm just checking, if this, fall, this is also false and this is also false, then this will also all be true. So in other words, if these are both false or if these are both true, this whole thing will be true. And so I want to know is the velocity left while the angle is greater than 90, or is the velocity right while the angle is less than or equal to 90. In either of those cases, 
I'm going to add 180 again to the angle. This is just a case of making sure that I'm going to interpret things right. And this basically means I'm getting the new velocity. So in other words, this is a case where if I'm moving left, I want to reverse the effect of what I was getting. Or if the case is that the angle is uh, obtuse or you know, flipped the other way, as it were, then I want to also reverse the effect of what I'm about to do. And that's why I add 180 here. Uh, so in either of those cases, basically moving left. And I'll give you an example. So if you're moving right and you hit a platform that's sort of angled up and to the right, you want to keep moving to the right, but you want to move up. But if you were moving left and you ran into that, you would want to start moving down. And so that's basically what is happening here. So now the new velocity is this angle axis. This is just a little uh, magic here. I take angle axis of that angle, uh, vector 3 forward, and I multiply it by the right. And that's basically going to be the new velocity. So that's uh, our, you could say, that's the xy velocity. Um, Cartesian rotation in space. Uh, so if you're going to be going, if you're going to the right and you're starting to go up into the right, that's going to be your new velocity up into the right. And so now I just make sure that this new velocity is uh, normalized, and then I multiply it by its magnitude and I apply that to its velocity. So the final velocity is this new velocity with the original magnitude as its velocity. Uh, preserved. And so this is all the math involved in getting it to follow these, to just follow it. And so the logic there is pretty much it. That's, that's the entire logic. Um, and there isn't anything else too crazy going on. Um, I might have, uh, oh, here's a deal where if you exit um, now and the thing you exited um, if it's a ceiling, if it was a ceiling, and if it's transform equals the ceiling that we recorded earlier, in other words, if the ceiling is the same ceiling that we just were touching, then we say, okay, the last thing we touched is no longer being touched. You know, okay, we must be touching nothing, so no, we're no longer touching the ceiling. The ceiling is now known. And this comes in handy later because if you were roaming around and you say flew off into space by mistake and that, that kind of fix the ceiling so that can never ever happen. But if for some reason it, that would were to happen, I could check this and I could say, oh well you're not touching the ceiling, you're in fine mode. What are you doing flying off into space? You should be going down again. And so I actually have a little failsafe which does that just in case you fly off into space and says you've gone too high go back to find a and start finding something. You're ridiculous, uh, so it fixes the lander in that case. So a lot of these, uh, my, my pattern that I follow is uh, I have a function to start some new behavior, like start start routine. the actual curve routine that does the roaming, and it just keeps on roaming while its state is roaming, and then when it decides to change state, then it just exits this, and it'll be running some other curve routine. Uh, and then Stuff like uh, fire at players, just a co-routine that hangs around, does that sort of stuff. And so, in the same uh, in the same way, if I'm in this fine settler mode, then I must be running this fine settler co-routine here. Uh, and so I do so check stuff like uh, are you touching the ceiling? Here it is. Are you not touching the ceiling? Uh, is your Y here in the image moving out towards the top of the screen? And are you too high now? Have you gone beyond the altitude? Then go back to roaming, and that will eventually be to you having to find what you get. Because you'll start moving down. And so that's what those do. Uh, and that's the trick for that. The trick for keeping things inside of the terrain and having the terrain loop is the next trick. Uh, and let me give you a quick overview of that. Okay, so here we have our world. Uh, I've hidden the other half of the world, world half one, world half two. Um, and you can see there's some overlap of the ceiling bits between these two now. And that's fine. Uh, that's helpful because yeah, if one runs into one, we we'll just keep going because the angle is precisely the same, it's just flat. Uh, and so that should ensure that 
whenever one crosses over uh, from one to the other, if it's in the right mode, they definitely do the right thing that will end up flying off in the space, even if for some reason it was way off at the end. Which again can never happen because I actually had fail safe for all of that. Whenever uh, an enemy leaves one end of one of these world halves, say off to the left of the half of this world, it runs off here, it reappears in the opposite end of the opposite of the other world. So in the case of something that say ran off to this end here and kept going, it would be at the opposite end of the other world, in other words, Whoa. way over Sorry, I wanted to do a special effect there. Pardon my clicking. Uh, in other words, way over here, right next to where it is. In other words, it would be exactly where it was, continuing to move along, but only parented to the other world. Uh, and that's the general idea of the, uh, keeping things in these world halves and parented to them. It means that in a platform where something is falling and suddenly the words shift and it's not there anymore, it will be something will be there. You can make sure that something is there. You can also set it up in such a way that you have whole worlds, just have the whole world, but repeat the whole world. And that can also, but again, you have, then you sign, you might assume that there are borders on the ends of that world. You have to come up with some way to make sure, just things that don't fall off the edge of the world, if there is some edge to the world. Uh, in this case, it's very simple. There's no gravity, there's nothing weird. Things are pretty well controlled in this game. Uh, so far. <laughs> See what the new enemies might bring. But uh, to give you an example, uh, an overview of that code, it's pretty straightforward. Again, uh, for something that's a looping terrain, uh, this is it. This is all a looping terrain does. It starts out and it uh, becomes active. It makes a copy of its transform. It remembers the main camera transforms use it repeatedly. And then during the update routine it just calls move to camera X, which checks to see uh, what is the world first it gets the world size, these are costs, so it gets set at compile time. Uh, world size divided by two, world size divided by four, so maybe values. Uh, current position of me. Uh, am I um, again this is the true am I how far am I from the camera? Is position x minus world size four. If my uh, if my difference is greater than half of the world, then while my difference is greater than half of the world, move me to the right and make that difference that much less. And then uh, set my new position. There. And in the other case, if you're further in the other direction, it does the same thing. Too far to the, left, uh, to the right, then move me to the left. Figure until my position is set. And that's it. Just make sure that the looping terrain stays within uh, its range of the camera. And there's two of those. So this does this twice per update. It's simple. And the object, uh, each object is checking its state. For a looping world item, we do something a little more involved. Uh, the world halves are kept in a in a global space where there's accesses to the world halves. Um, let's see how I work that. Um, yeah, offender dot half world t. So I have the transform of each of each of these half worlds stored in the offender object, which is the game. And that might not be the best place for them. It. it might be better to have uh, a couple of statics or something like that that the looping world uses. And I may go to that eventually, but for now um, it's just kept in Fender. And then uh, I may, uh, part of that reasoning is too that that may change in such a way like uh, I might have the world halves actually, I want them to be uh, updated during the game or change in some, uh, from level to level, then I'd like to, be able to change those values and so, but where they're localized is important. And so right now they're so that's not such a big deal. So each uh, looping world item, that is to say every enemy or um, uh, object on the screen that moves around and needs to be parented to these worlds is going to inherit from this, and this inherits directly from modern behavior. So this is sort of the root object of anything that's in the game that is not, say, the player. Um, 
and then we have uh, a world half index that just remembers which world half I'm in. Uh, then when we initialize, and the way the pattern, again, another pattern I follow is that when I instantiate something, I also call init immediately afterwards so that I can pass additional parameters to it. And that's uh, so that you, know, you, you can basically say uh, you want it to be purple and you can pass a color or whatever and have it be purple from the thing, from the place that it's being instantiated. That can be helpful uh, to have that kind of pattern, and so I've been using it a lot. Uh, so all my things have public virtual inmits on them, and then they call their parent inmits. So here we have, uh, if my parent transform hasn't been set yet, then I set one uh, that's been passed. Well, or I should say, if uh, so we pass a parent transform when creating one of these things, it doesn't necessarily automatically get parent into the half world. That's just something I can use for overriding stuff. Say, if I want to show them the attract mode around the title screen, I can say, oh, I'll create this thing, but don't parent it to the half world because I want it to be, say, on top of the screen. So that is convenient. And then, but if I don't pass something to it, it does automatically parent to it to the nearest half world or the half world that it should parent to based on its position. And you can use a modulo kind of thing there. So if the world is 10,000, and if I put you at 11,000, well, you're really at 1,000, because you might subtract 10,000, or now you see 10,000, and there you are. Uh, so that's that. Then in my awake, I set the transform, uh, keep the transform in T. Uh, let's see, start. Oh, here we are. So when I start, I make and check, uh, I put you within the world. Make sure that I'm in the world half that I'm supposed to be in, if my world half index is set. And again, Every time fixed update calls, uh, I do the same thing. And that fixed update is often enough to, to do this. So otherwise things are moving, they're doing their, their physics. The only thing I'm going to be changing is its position and the thing it's parented to. But it should keep on moving in the way it's moving and all of its velocity and rigid body behavior should continue to behave exactly as they were. Um, it may seem to pop out of existence and then pop back into existence, but within the game, except for things that are at far, far opposite ends, as far away from you as anything can be, uh, there's nothing that ever pops out and pops into the opposite side. Uh, so those are the only times where things are happening, and so I haven't seen any weird anomalies at those ends, so fingers crossed, hopefully they will continue to be good, because they just, they don't last, uh, uh, that jump is so quick. From one side to the other, it's just changing the coordinates in one frame. So anyway, we, uh, we get the current position. I check to see if we're out of the range, uh, and I switch parents. And so you know, that, that is to say, TI is going to be my new world half index, um, my new terrain index, I guess. Uh, is what TI stands for, that's what I used to call it. Uh, but I may change that. Um, so right now, uh, we say, uh, put in the other world half, and then subtract, in this case, the half size, half world size. Or in the opposite instance where um, I'm really far in the other direction, then I uh, add. And so in either case, I'm on the other side, and then, uh, then I check to see if I have, did I just move to the other half of the world? Then set a new one, and then I set a new parent, and then I set my new position. That's pretty much the whole thing. Um, and then the initial parenting to the half world is similar. Uh, I get the world size and world size value of 2. I check my position. Uh, I subtract uh, world size times uh, math floor position x divided by world size. So this is basically a modulo right here. Um, this, is, this becomes within a single world size. And so I did some replication, some, some, some division. Uh, to get that value. And then here I have uh, which world half index is it? Well, if you're in this half, then it must be zero, and if you're in this half, it must be one. And then if it's zero, then you should subtract your coordinate and make it half of what it was inside that world. And that's what happens here. Um, and then it turns out half worlds are offset by a quarter world, so to speak, because the origin of each point is in the center. 
Uh, so I have to actually make its position that much more off. And then I then I set the parent of the object to its half wheel. And finally, its local position is set to the, that position that I got, which started out as uh, originally as position. Position in the universe, this is local position within the parent object right here, is going to be based on that all that modular stuff that I got here. So all that math just to get down to this is the position you're going to be in, this is the parent you're going to be in. And then uh, when I restore something, which is restoring from save, sort of, not from save, but have this save restore sort of concept. I put things into a disabled game object that by putting them in a disabled game object they become disabled and then I turn them off and it's all their coroutines stop. But I remember their state because they don't have a state variable. So restore is a function that gets called whenever something gets restored from that little cache and then re enabled. I could have put this in say enable but restore is a little bit different. It's uh, I've just come back from say a two-player game, and switched to a different player, but I'm and I've moved to a different place, but it's the same world. Sometimes you know, and that's different from moving between two-player game where maybe the entire state is saved and you just reinitialize from where they are. In this case, I'm not so much reinitializing as uh, just hiding all the enemies and then bringing new enemies in and then saying, "Keep going, player. You're now player two. Uh, and it works. Uh, Pretty well. In this case, the restore of a uh, of any one of these types of objects would make sure to reparent it because the worlds can move around while the game is being played, and then you go to restore where things were, and now the whole world has moved, and you have to wait a frame before they end up in the right place. This makes sure that you don't have to wait that extra frame that they'll end up in the right place, uh, only if they who have already parented to something that so had a world before. And it actually is smart. It parents it to a half world, but it could very well just simply parent it. Um, right at this point, I could do a much smaller routine to parent it, knowing already that it's going to be parented to that world after knowing its position already is going to be a certain, it's got its current local position, it will still be its local position, etc. That could all be done here instead, but we just do this because it's convenient. It's already written. It doesn't take that long, and so it's not a bottleneck of the game. So I just kept it, keep the code small, so keep that, do that. So that's the essence of all the work I've done to make this landscape work and to make the game play field work in the game. Put it all together, and you have uh, something which resembles, uh, which very much resembles a defender like game. So I suppose next time I'll probably get into um, to, uh, some of the other stuff, uh, some of the particle stuff, maybe some of the, uh, some of the uh, scoring stuff, and just sort of the general uh, organization of the game, and how this all works together to create the effect we finally see.